who appears at the judgment seat of Christ in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. Now, there's a teaching circulating on the internet that the judgment seat of Christ is an event for the little flock, and it's not for the body of Christ. Well, look with me at 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. The obvious problem with that teaching, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. And so if you just read 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10 naturally, it seems like the judgment seat of Christ is, uh, is an event that is for the body of Christ. It doesn't seem to be for the little flock. But some are claiming that it's actually for the little flock. So what we'll do in our time tonight is we will first analyze the arguments that people use as to why the judgment seat of Christ in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10 is for the little flock. We'll look at those arguments and evaluate them. And then once we do that, we're going to spend some time in 2 Corinthians 5, and we're just going to let 2 Corinthians 5 tell us what the answer is. We're just going to read the verses and let them show us what the answer is. So we're going to start by understanding the argument as to why the judgment seat of Christ is for the little flock. So look with me at 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And so the argument that says the judgment seat of Christ is for the little flock goes along the following lines. The first step of the argument is that the we in verse 10 is the same we as verse 1. That's, not, that's reasonable. There's nothing wrong with that. But then the argument says this. If you read verse 1, verse 1 cannot be about the body of Christ. It has to be about the little flock because of the words that are used. So let's read verse 1 again. For if we know that our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, the argument is that the word tabernacle can only pertain to the prophecy program and not the mystery program. Similarly, the argument is made that the word dissolved, every other time it's used but here, refers to the prophetic program and not the mystery program. So therefore, when you read verse 1 and you come across the word tabernacle and you come across the word dissolved, it tells you this has to be about the little flock. It can't be about the body of Christ because those words are never used with regard to the body of Christ. This is the way the argument goes. So then, once you realize verse 1 must be about the little flock, verse 10, which also has we, just like verse 1, has to be about the little flock as well. So essentially the argument is, that the we in verse 10 is the same we as verse 1. That's not, that's not a bad point. But when you read verse 1, it has these special words. And these special words are dissolved and tabernacle. And those words can only refer to the little flock. They cannot be used with regard to the body of Christ. And that's the point we really have to carefully evaluate. So we're going to start with the word dissolved. And so the way the argument goes is that the word dissolved appears eight times in Scripture, and eight is the number of new beginnings. So let's consider that. So let's go to our friend, Blue Letter Bible, and uh, we're here in 2 Corinthians 5. Let's just let it boot up here. So if we run the word dissolved, let's see how many times it appears. So Blue Letter Bible is thinking and it's going to give us the answer. 
and I would hum the Jeopardy music, but my humming is no better than my dancing. So look, dissolved only appears eight times. Well, it is true that dissolved only appears eight times, but just so you understand, the other forms of, of dissolve appear more than eight times. So in other words, look at this, dissolvist. That's also a form of the word dissolve. And the whole argument about it only appearing eight times and being the number of new beginnings sort of disappears when you realize that the other forms of the word dissolve don't add up to eight. It actually adds up to 11. Now here's what happens. The argument says, and let's just go, well, let's, we'll just, let's leave it, we'll leave it right here on dissolve with the wild card. And notice this, as we scroll through there, there's only one of those that is a Pauline reference. See, all the other ones are before or after. 2 Corinthians 5, 1 is the only Pauline reference. And so someone says, look, if you look at the word dissolve, every single time it's used, it's used with regard to the prophecy program. So Paul only uses it once. Therefore, this must also be a reference to the prophecy program. Now just pause for a minute and think. Does that argument make any sense? Is there something about the word dissolve that is so magical, that is so prophetic, that it can only refer to the prophecy program? Let me ask you this. Who in the Bible talks about grace more than any other person? Paul. Well, does that mean that every time you see grace in the Scripture, it's a reference to the dispensation of grace? I mean, think about this. Paul was given the dispensation of the grace of God. That's true. And he was given the gospel of the grace of God, Acts 20, verse 24. But is the word grace used in other parts of the Bible? It is. Because words are words. No one owns them. Other people are allowed to use them. There's nothing that says Paul can't use the word dissolved. So the argument, just as a general matter, really doesn't make any sense. There's no reason that Paul couldn't use the word dissolved. But I want you to notice something further. And so notice what we're going to do here with Blue Letter Bible. So we're going to look at 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1. And what I'm going to do, and I'll just tell you this in advance, I'm going to show you something from the Greek. Now, some people are going to lose their minds. They're going to say, you're going to the Greek to correct the Bible. You don't really believe the Bible because you're going to the Greek. Blah, blah, blah. There's going to be lots of objections and lots of whining because that's how life is. But watch what I do carefully because this is completely legitimate. Now watch this. I'm going to go up here and I'm going to click on Strong's. So watch this. I'm going to click on Strong's, and it's going to respond. Just give it a minute. It's thinking very deeply about this subject. It wants to make sure it gets it right. You know, it doesn't want to rush into anything. It wants to think very carefully. So what this will do, Strong's is a reference to Strong's Concordance. Now, we'll scroll down here to 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1. And what, what this did is after each word or set of words, it gave us a little uh, number. It gave us here G1063. And what that does is that tells us the Greek word that was translated as four. G1492 was the Greek word that was translated as we know, and so on. Well, if we do this, notice what happens. Word dissolved was translated from the Greek word G2647. Now, why does that matter? We were told that the word dissolve is a special word, and it can only refer to the prophetic program, and Paul only used it once. Well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to click on G2647. And what is that going to do? That's going to take us 
to every place in the King James Version where that Greek word is in the underlying text. And so this will show us if that actually is the only place that that word appears. So you can see this here is G2647. This is Strong's, and this is Kataluo, which is the Greek word. Now, what we're going to do is we're just going to scroll down here. And I'm not even going to spend time looking at what it says because I don't care what it says because the English is perfectly fine. But what I'm going to show you is this. If we scroll down here, notice what we're going to find. Let's keep going, going, going. Now look at this. We find 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1, but what else do we find? We find Romans 14 20 and Galatians 2 18. Is 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1 the only place that Paul uses the word dissolve? You do know, of course, that when Paul wrote the, New Te the books of the New Testament that he wrote, he didn't write them in English, right? He wrote them in, in Greek. Well, G2647 is not only in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1, it's in Romans 14, 20, and it's, and it's in Galatians 2, 18. Now, why does that, that matter? Well, the argument is the word dissolved can only apply to the prophetic program. It can't apply to the body of Christ. Well, let's look at these other verses and see if those verses hold up that argument. So let's start with Romans 14, verse 20. Romans 14, verse 20. For meat, destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. Now I want you to think with me. Is Romans 14, 20 addressed to the little flock? Let's read it again. For meat... Destroy not the work of God. Now notice what it says. All things indeed are pure. Is that something that the little flock taught? That all things indeed are pure? Think about that for a minute. Now, when you study the book of Romans, one thing you should know is that Romans is written in Acts chapter 20. Romans is written in Acts chapter 20. What we're going to do is we're going to turn to Acts chapter 21. Acts chapter 21. Acts 21 is after Acts chapter 20. Look with me in Acts 21 at verse 17. And when we, this is Paul, were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. And the day following, Paul went in with us unto James, and all the elders were present. And when he has saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. And when they heard it, these are the elders in Jerusalem, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe and they are all zealous of the law. So in Acts 21, Paul is in Jerusalem. He's talking to James, and James is telling him about the little flock. He's telling him about the group of kingdom believers in Jerusalem. And what does he say about them? They are all zealous of the law. Well, does the law say something about whether all meats are pure? You know this. What does Leviticus 11 say? There are some animals that are clean. There are some animals that are not clean. Verse 21, And they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after their customs. Now, do you understand what you just learned? Paul writes the book of Romans in Acts 20, and he uses the same word for dissolve. Well, in Romans 14:20, is 
is that for the little flock, or is Paul writing to the body of Christ? What he says to them is he says, all things are pure. Did the little flock believe all things are pure? In the following chapter, Scripture itself tells us that they were zealous of the law. And just in case there was any doubt about what law was being referenced in Acts 20, 20, verse 21 talks about Moses. Well, what does the Mosaic law say about all things indeed are pure? It says the opposite of that, doesn't it? See, what that tells you is this. In Romans 14, 20, Paul is not writing to the little flock. He's writing to the body of Christ, which is what we all know to be the case. He can't be writing to the little flock because what he says is contrary to the doctrine that the little flock believed. So in Romans 14, Paul uses G2647. He uses the Greek word for dissolve, and it's not talking about the little flock. It's not talking about Israel. It's a reference for the body of Christ. Now, the other verse that uses G2647 is Galatians 2.18. So let's look at Galatians 2.18. Galatians chapter 2, verse 18. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Now, is Galatians 2.18 addressed to the little flock? What pronoun does Paul use? He says, I. So don't tell me Galatians 2.18 is about the little flock unless you're going to say that Paul is a member of the little flock, which we'll deal with that later. But you realize Galatians 2.18 is not doctrine for the little flock. Paul says, for I, that's me, Paul, through the law, or verse 18, for if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. That's Paul talking about himself. Well, does that Greek word, is, is there a limitation on that where it can only ever refer to the little flock? That's just not true. Paul uses that word to refer to himself. Just like in Romans 14, 20, he uses it to refer to the body of Christ. Just like Paul uses the word grace, but Moses also uses the word grace. In other words, different people can use the same word. There's no, this argument doesn't make any sense. People are all allowed to use these words. You have to understand them by looking at their context. Now, someone's going to whine that we went to the Greek and complain, but you realize that we didn't go to the Greek and study the meaning of the Greek. All we did was show that this word dissolved, which is supposed to be so magical and so special that it can only ever refer to the prophecy program. It can only be for the little flock, and it cannot be for the body of Christ. Paul uses the same word when he's talking to the body of Christ, and he uses the same word when he's talking about himself. So this argument doesn't make any sense. It is completely invalid, and it just doesn't prove the point. So here's, so then just follow this with me then. If you decide, well, I don't, I don't believe that. If you decide dissolve is this special word that can only refer to the little flock, then notice what you have to do. Then Romans 14 also has to be for the little flock. Galatians 2 also has to be for the little flock. And just consider how far that argument goes. So here's what people then say. Well, moreover, at the rapture, the bodies of the members of, the, of Christ, the, body, the, mem, the people who are in the body of Christ, let's do it that way. The people who are in the body of Christ, their bodies aren't dissolved, they're changed. Different word. P 
people who are in the body of Christ don't have their bodies dissolved. And I don't, I don't understand that argument either. Think about your body for a minute. 1 Corinthians 15.53 describes the flesh you currently have as corruptible. Philippians 3.21, let's just look at this together, Philippians 3.21. Notice what Philippians 3.21 says about your body. Who shall change our vile body. So what is your current body? Is it attractive? Is it perfect? It's vile. And the reason why it's vile is you have a sinful, you have the you have the sin nature residing in your flesh. Look at Romans 7. Romans chapter 7. Romans 7. And let's look at verse 18, Romans 7, 18. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. So what does God think of your current physical body? Well, it's corruptible, it's vile, and what dwells within it is no good thing. God does not, at the rapture, take the vileness and the corruption and the wickedness of your body and just shift it around, around like Play-Doh into a new form because it would still be vile and corruptible and sinful. Instead, what happens at the rapture is you get an entirely new body that is of a different substance. Look with me at 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 44. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. In other words, the two are different. Well, let me ask you a question. I mean, you realize the natural body and the spiritual body are not the same thing. What do you think God does with your natural body at the rapture? Does he put it on display in a museum? So you can walk through, you're like, ah, there's Stephen's natural body. It looks so great. You realize he doesn't do that because your natural body is vile and corruptible. Does God do this? Does, does God take your natural body and he puts it on one side of the closet, like your old pair of shoes? You know how you have the old pair of shoes that you keep around because if something happens to your good pair, you need a backup? Does God save your natural body as plan B in case your spiritual body develops some sort of problem? Or does he destroy it because he has no further use for it? See, once you get the spiritual body, there is no use for the natural body. And the natural body being corruptible and vile and having no good thing in it will be destroyed. Because God doesn't want any sin in the new heaven and the new earth. So your old, vile body will be destroyed or dissolved, and you'll never, ever, ever see it again. Look at me at, your, look at, me at Romans 7.23. And let's just make sure that this point is clear. Romans 7.23 Romans chapter 7, verse 23. But I see another law in my members. See, the problem is in your physical body. Warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. See, in your members resides the law of sin. God doesn't want this earthly body because he has future use for it because there's not going to be any sin in the new heavens and the new earth. So this body has to be gotten rid of. It has to be dissolved, disintegrated, destroyed. Now, by the way, you also know this, don't you? There are members of the body of Christ who have already had their bodies dissolved. People who die in explosions, or, or, or for example. So the point is, we've looked at this argument that the word dissolve 
is some special word, and it cannot apply to the body of Christ. It can only apply to the little flock. And the argument doesn't make any sense as a general matter, and it's just not true, because Paul uses that same word to refer to the body of Christ and refer to himself. So now let's consider the word tabernacle. Similar argument. The word tabernacle can only apply to Israel. Do you know what the word tabernacle means? So we're going to go to DuckDuckGo. This is my favorite search engine here, and this is super easy. So watch this. Webster's 1828 Dictionary. I probably misspelled it. I don't know. Maybe I didn't. Let's let it search. So DuckDuckGo is going to find a dictionary for us, and here we go. We're going to click on the first hit, and it's going to take us to an online Webster's 1828 dictionary, one of, one of my favorite dictionaries. Now I'm going to type the word tabernacle just so we can see what the word means, and the, it's going to tell us. Now look, look here. This is really fairly simple, tabernacle, noun, so on, a tent. Look at the very first meaning of the word. A tabernacle is a tent. Now think about that just for a minute. The argument is that tabernacle is this special word, and it can only apply to the little flock. So every time you see the word tabernacle, it's about the prophetic program. It can't be about the mystery. Well, what does the word tabernacle mean? It's a tent. Can I, can I tell you something? We got to think better. You can't just believe stuff because it's on the internet. You have to think. You have to use your brain. You have to search all things. If someone says the word tabernacle, can only apply to Israel or the little flock, and it can't refer to the body of Christ. you got to think. Look at Acts 18, verse 1. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. So think about this argument. The word tabernacle is a special word. It can only refer to the little flock. It cannot refer to the body of Christ. I got to stop because I'm getting excited. What was Paul? He was a tent maker. The word tabernacle means tent. Your argument is that a tent maker can't use the word that means tent? Are you serious? Friends, members of the body of Christ, we have to be better than this. This is not reasonable. This is not sensible. This is not logical. Now, I got all excited there. Let me just state this because I, I want to make sure this is not... I want to try to resolve this and get this clear. If you're going to say the word tabernacle can only be used for the little flock, you should consider what the word tabernacle means. The word tabernacle means tent. How can you say that Paul can't use the word for tent when he is a tent maker. This doesn't make any sense whatsoever. This is not a valid argument. We have got to be better than this. People put things on the internet, and people say, wow, that was awesome. That was so great. They listened to it. There was something that appealed to them. They said, yeah, you're right. You have to search all things. You have to use your brain. Someone telling you that Paul cannot use the word tent is not reasonable. 
It is nonsense talk. It is not a valid argument, and you should reject it. I apologize. I'm getting a little excited, but this stuff is, is craziness. Now, let me pause here before I shift. The two big arguments, well, the word dissolve can only refer to the little flock, but that's just not true. The word tabernacle can only refer to the little flock or Israel. Well, neither of those are true. None of those arguments even make any sense. And what that tells you is those arguments were invented after the conclusion was already reached. You would never read the scriptures and conclude that Paul can't use the word for tent. You would conclude the exact opposite. But those are just arguments people invent because they've already decided what they want to believe. So I suggest a different approach. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 5, and let's let 2 Corinthians 5 just tell us what it means. Get, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we're going to start in verse 1. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Now, just so we're clear, what we're trying to resolve is who is the we in 2 Corinthians 5? Is the we the little flock, or is the we the body of Christ? Who is the we? So let's read verse 1 again, and let's pay very careful attention to what it tells us about the we. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. Well, whoever this we is, they have a house not made with hands, and what is it? Eternal in the heavens. Now think with me. If you say the we is the little flock, what are you saying? I mean, think about this with me just for a minute. The little flock is in Luke 12, 32. The little flock is promised the kingdom. The body of Christ is during the dispensation of grace. If you say the little flock is eternal in the heavens, you're not a mid-Acts dispensationalist. You can claim to be one. You can pretend to be one. You can play one on TV. But you are not a mid-Acts dispensationalist. Now you say, well, brother, that's, that's pretty rough. How can you say that? Just because someone believes the little flock's eternal in the heavens? Well, let's look at the verses and see what the verses say. Look with me at Luke 12. Luke 12. Now while you're turning there, I'm going to flip to the version of the chart that hides the mystery, and I'll show you why. Luke 12, verse 32. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Now, Luke 12, 32 is written before the cross. It's written before the revelation of the mystery. When the little flock was promised the kingdom, what kingdom are they promised? Well, they're obviously promised the millennial kingdom, and they're promised the new earth. There is no dispensation of grace that they were promised. They weren't promised anything about spiritual blessings in heavenly places. They're looking for an earthly kingdom. Look with me in Luke 11. Look what Luke 11 says about the kingdom that they were promised in Luke 12. Luke 11, verse 2. And he said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so in earth. What is Luke 11 saying? What the little flock was looking for is they're looking for thy kingdom, what? Come. When does the kingdom come? The kingdom comes at the second coming. 
when the King of Kings, the Lord Jesus Christ, comes and establishes it, and he reigns for a thousand years. In Luke 11, 12, when they pray the so-called Lord's Prayer, they are looking for his earthly kingdom to come to this earth. That's the kingdom they expect. Now, the reason they expected that, get Genesis 13. Get Genesis 13. The reason they were looking for the kingdom to come to the earth is because that is what had been promised throughout the Old Testament. Look with me at Genesis 13, verse 14. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art, northward, and southward, and eastward, and westward. For all the land which thou seest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. What does God tell Abram early on? I'm going to give you this land, Abram, all of this land that you can see, to you and your seed forever. So what should Israel expect based upon that promise? Should they expect to be eternal in the heavens? No. They should expect to be in the land forever. Because that's what God told them he was going to give them. God doesn't lie. Everything he says is true. When he promises Israel an earthly kingdom, they're going to have an earthly kingdom. But recall 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1. The we, in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1, they have a house not made with hands. And where is it located? Eternal in the heavens. Now I'm going to do a quick question. You ready? Do you know of any group of people in the scriptures that are eternal in the heavens? And we're really talking about a group of humans. Any group of humans that you know that's eternal in the heavens? Well, look with me at 1 Thessalonians 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians 4 is a reference to the rapture. And notice what it says. Verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. You know why the body of Christ is caught up as opposed to sideways? It's because where are we going? We're going to heaven. That is our destination. We're not promised a kingdom on the earth. We're not promised to be part of the new Jerusalem. We're not promised to be part of the new earth. What we are promised, look at Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1 verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us, with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Where are our heavenly blessings, excuse me, where are our spiritual blessings located? Heavenly places. So where do we have to go? We have to go to heavenly places. Look with me at Colossians 1. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1 verse 5. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. When Paul writes to the Colossians, members of the body of Christ, where is their hope laid up? It's in heaven. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3 verse 20. For our conversation is in heaven. Our conversation is not on this earth. It's in heaven. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2, verse 6. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, all those verses are talking about the body of Christ, unless you're going to somehow claim that 
Ephesians and Colossians and Philippians, none of those books are written to the body of Christ, and I guess everything is for the little flock. I mean, I guess you could make stuff up if you want to. But isn't it rather obvious, 1 Thessalonians 4.17, we are caught up because we are going to heaven, and the reason why we're doing that is we have all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, and our hope is laid up for us in heaven, because our conversation is in heaven, and because we're made to sit together in heavenly places. The body of Christ is a heavenly people. When 2 Corinthians 5, 1 uses the word we, it says we have a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Is that talking about the little flock, which is going to inherit an earthly kingdom? Or is it talking about the body of Christ, which is obviously a heavenly people that has spiritual blessings in heavenly places, that's been made to sit together in heavenly places? Isn't it obvious, if you just let the word say what it says, that 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1 is about the body of Christ, and it has nothing at all to do with the little flock? Now, I'm going to say this again. If you make the little flock eternal in the heavens, you're abandoning dispensational truth. And you can do what you want to do. You have liberty to believe whatever you want to believe. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. You have free will to do whatever you want. But let's just be honest about things. If you make the little flock eternal in the heavens, you're not a mid-ax dispensationalist. You're not. And the reason why is the most basic distinctions in the scriptures that dispensationalists recognize is there's a difference between prophecy and mystery. There's a difference between Israel and the body of Christ, and there's a difference between heaven and earth. And everyone, every dispensationalist ought to know that Israel has an earthly inheritance. The body of Christ has a heavenly inheritance. These are the most basic, the most basic principles of dispensationalism. And if you want to now say, well, the little flock is eternal in the heavens, I don't even know what to say to that. You you, you are abandoning the most basic dispensational principles. Again, you can do whatever you want. You don't account to me, do whatever you want, but you realize You're not just changing 2 Corinthians 5. You have to change Ephesians. You have to change Philippians. You have to change Colossians. There are a whole bunch of scriptures. You have to change what they plainly say to fit your agenda. You're better off just letting the scriptures say what it says and believe what it says. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians 5. Now, in 2 Corinthians 5, we looked at verse 1, and we looked at some cross-references. Look at verse 2. For in this we groan. Well, the we in verse 2 is the same group of, it's the same we as in verse 1. Well, notice what it says. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. So who's the we in verse 2? Because it's, it would seem to be the same we in verse 1. I mean, Paul didn't put a little note there that says, yeah, in verse 1 I was talking about these folks, but now I changed subjects. There's nothing like that. It's the same group of people. Well, what's the cross-reference for this? For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. What other Pauline cross-reference about groaning should immediately come to mind? Romans 8.23. So get it, Romans 8.23. Romans chapter 8 and verse 23. Romans 8.23. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves. You see the cross reference there? Romans 8.23 is a clear cross-reference to 2 Corinthians 5, verse 2. But then notice what it says. We ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. Unbelievable. 
Romans 8.23 is a reference to the rapture, the adoption, the redemption of our body. So if you make the we in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1, the little flock, then you have to make the we in verse 2, the little flock, and the cross reference for 2 Corinthians 5 verse 2 that talks about groaning is about the body of Christ waiting for the rapture. So if you make the little flock, if you make the we in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1, the little flock, then guess what? The little flock is waiting for the rapture. Does that make any sense whatsoever when the Lord told them they were getting the kingdom? You realize what a theological disaster that is? The, the, the amount of confusion that creates is, is just endless. Get 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 3. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. That's a reference to Romans 8, 23. Not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. Verse 5. Now he that hath wrought us for the self same thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. So, notice verse 5. He's given unto us. You realize us is the object form of we, right? So, we is the subject. We went to the park. We is the subject. They gave gifts to us. Us is an object. But they're both, uh, they're both first person. One is first person um, plural in the subjective form, and one is first person plural in the objective form. But you realize the real, they're referring to the same group of people. We all know this. We understand this. Okay. Well, he, he's given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. That's, and by the way, the us is the same as the we in the prior verses. There, there was nowhere in there where Paul said, you know, stop, I'm now talking about someone new. It's the same, same group of people. What verse tells you about the earnest of the Spirit? There's a clear cross-reference for this. Get with me, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse 21, now he which establisheth us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God, who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. That's what 2 Corinthians 5, 5 was referring to. So you see what happens? If you make the we in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1, the little flock, then verse 2 is the little flock, then verse 5 is the little flock, and it's not just 2 Corinthians 5 that's about the little flock. 2 Corinthians 1 is about the little flock as well. But you know that 2 Corinthians 1 is about the body of Christ. God's given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. That's what he did for the body of Christ. None of these, none of these passages are talking about the little flock. I hope you realize that. These are all a description of the body of Christ. Now, I want you to think about something with me. If in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1, you say, well, the we is the little flock, then you have to make the rest of 2 Corinthians 5 about the little flock. But then what you also have to do is you have to make all of these cross-references about the little flock. And now all of a sudden, Romans 8 is about the little flock. And the people that are waiting for the rapture, the adoption to wit the redemption of our body, well, that's the little flock. And the people in 2 Corinthians 1 that have the earnest of the Spirit, well, that's the little flock too. And what do you end up with if you do this? What you end up with is because the scriptures are interconnected, when you make one of them that's about the body of Christ, you say, no, no, no that's about the little flock, you're going to be forced to not just make that verse about the little flock, but you're going to have to make the cross references about the little flock. Now think about what that does. Paul's the apostle of the Gentiles, right? Romans 11, 13. He reaches an agreement in Acts 15 to go to the Gentiles. 
In Ephesians 3, he's, he, there's a reference to him being given the mystery that Gentiles are fellow heirs. Now, his ministry is to the Gentiles. Isn't that obvious? He's the apostle to the Gentiles. He was given the mystery that the Gentiles are, are fellow heirs. He specifically reaches an agreement to go to the Gentiles. And now you want to tell me all the books he writes are to the little flock? That didn't make any sense. And it makes Paul dishonest. Because in Acts 15, let's read it. Get Galatians 2. Get Galatians 2. We're going to turn here because I want you to see it with your own eyes. Galatians chapter 2, verse 7. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, Paul was given the gospel of the uncircumcision, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. Paul is the gospel of the uncircumcision, and his apostleship is to the Gentiles. Now notice what happens in verse 9. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go into the heathen, and they into the circumcision. Paul reaches an agreement to not go to the circumcision, but to go to the heathen, to go to Gentiles. So how can you say that in his epistles he keeps writing to the little flock? It, it, it doesn't make any sense, and it makes him to completely disregard what he agreed to do in Acts 15. Now, by the way, I want you to think about this for a minute. We're going to go back to Blue Letter Bible, and we're just going to run a little search here for the term little flock. And let's see how often the, the term is used in Scripture. Because the argument is that in 2 Corinthians 5, Paul is writing to the little flock. And not only in that place, but he must be writing to it in other places that are clear cross-references to the verses in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Well, I want you to notice something about the term little flock. It only appears once in Scripture, and it's in Luke. In other words, Paul never used the term little flock. So you're going to tell me that Paul wrote a bunch of his epistles to a group of people that he never even named. Does that make any sense? He wrote a bunch of his epistles to the little flock, kingdom saints, that he specifically agreed were not his ministry. That just doesn't make any sense. Get with me 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. The we is a reference to the body of Christ. It has nothing to do with the little flock. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1 is not about the little flock. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 2 is not about the little flock. None of 2 Corinthians 5 is about the little flock. And if it is, then I want you to show me where Paul says that. And you can't do it on the basis, well, he uses the word dissolve. You can't do it on the basis of he uses the word tabernacle. Paul made tents. He's allowed to use words. You have to show me where it specifically says, I am now writing to the little flock. And it doesn't say that. Now, if you've been listening up to now, there's about four million problems with the argument that the we in 2 Corinthians 5 is about the little flock. But I'm going to tell you, there's an even, even bigger problem. But wait, there's more. Look with me. At, at, we, we just read 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, but let's just do it again. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. When, Paul, when the word we appears in 2 Corinthians 5, get 2 Corinthians 1. I want you to notice this. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 1. Who wrote 2 Corinthians? Paul, right? Look at verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timothy our brother, unto the church of God which is at Corinth. So the author of 2 Corinthians is Paul. So in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10, when he uses the word we, he has to be included in it. That's just basic 
language, right? If Paul wasn't included in it, he would say them. But he doesn't say them in 2 Corinthians 5. He says we. So when he says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, Paul believed and he wrote by inspiration of the Holy Spirit that he was going to the judgment seat of Christ. So think about this. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, if you say the we is the little flock, you just made Paul a member of the little flock. Which is so crazy that I don't know what to tell you. Right? 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, for we, that includes the speaker, includes the writer, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Well, if the we is the little flock, then Paul is a member of the little flock. Get Romans 12. Romans 12, verse 5. So we, and Paul wrote Romans, so we being many are one body in Christ. What does Paul think he is? Does Paul think he's a member of the little flock, or does he think he's a member of the body of Christ? Romans 12, 5. So we being many are one body in Christ. That's not the little flock. 1 Corinthians 12. First Corinthians 12, verse 13. For by one Spirit are we, who wrote First Corinthians? Paul did. Are we all baptized into one body? What did Paul think he was a member of? Or better yet, forget Paul, what did the Holy Spirit think Paul was a member of? See, the Holy Spirit thinks Paul is a member of the body of Christ. Ephesians 5. What are you going to do? You're going to say all oh, these are about the little flock too? Romans is about the little flock? 1 Corinthians? Ephesians? Where does it end? Stop the madness. Ephesians 5, verse 30. For we are members of his body. Get Romans 8, 23. Romans 8, verse 23, And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, the we includes Paul, we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. I, I don't know how Scripture could be more clear that Paul is a member of the body of Christ. It tells you multiple times that he's a member of the body of Christ. Romans 8, 23 tells you that what is he waiting for? We are waiting for the adoption to the redemption of our body. He's looking for the rapture. Paul thinks he's a member of the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit thinks that as well. Get 1 Thessalonians 4. First Thessalonians 4, verse 13. Let's start in verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Verse 17, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. Is 1 Thessalonians to the little flock too? I mean, isn't it obvious that when Paul says, we, 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 he's like the little, yeah, who, yeah, the little piggy that went to market. Yeah. See, we, we have very sophisticated literary illusions on this program because we're very sophisticated. But my point is, what do you do with all these we verses? Because Paul wrote all these books, and he uses we all the time. Are you going to say that every time he uses the word we, he's talking about the little flock? Do you realize what that does to dispensational thought? It's a complete and total repudiation of dispensational thought. It makes all these things about the little flock and not the body of Christ. I would, I would encourage you not to do that. You're, you're just resting the scriptures. So what we've seen is this. Let's return to our original question. 
in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10, who appears before the judgment seat of Christ? Well, the answer is the body of Christ does. It's not the little flock. Paul doesn't use the term little flock. You can't show where he uses the term little flock. He writes to the body of Christ because that was his ministry. So, mistakes happen. People get things wrong. None of us are perfect. When you make a mistake, what you should do is admit it and just say, you know, I thought that, but I was wrong, so I'm changing my tune. I'm going to believe what the Scripture says. But if you don't do that, here's the danger. If you take a passage that is specifically addressed to the body of Christ, that's about the body of Christ, and you say, no, it's not. It's not because it's really about the little flock because it has the word dissolve or it has the word tabernacle. God designed for us to study the Bible according to 1 Corinthians 2.13, by comparing spiritual things with spiritual. The reason you look at cross-references is it's like a jigsaw puzzle. The verses fit together. And if you take something that's clearly about the body of Christ, and you say, well, no, no, this is about the little flock, you didn't just knock over one domino. You knocked over a whole bunch of dominoes because there's a whole bunch of cross-references, right? We went through just a few verses in 2 Corinthians 5, but it took us to Romans, and it took us to 2 Corinthians 1. And when you look at the inheritance of the body of Christ, you go to Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians, and you realize those are all interconnected. And if you make the judgment seat of Christ about the little flock, which, by the way, let's do one more search just for fun here. So I'm going to run a search for judgment seat of Christ. And I did that as a phrase. So this will tell us every place where the phrase judgment seat of Christ appears. Now, we already ran the search for little flock. And when we did that, we realized Paul doesn't even use the term. It's clearly a kingdom term before the cross, before the mystery was even revealed. So that that obviously, the little flock is, is, is something separate. Now, look at this. The term judgment seat of Christ only appears twice, and they're both Pauline. Now think about this with me. You know what that means? If the judgment seat of Christ is for the little flock, which it isn't, but if it was, that means in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which are all about the little flock, it never even uses the term or refers to the judgment seat of Christ. That doesn't make any sense. So, in closing, the judgment seat of Christ is for the body of Christ. That's as clear as can be. It's not for the little flock. Now, everyone has liberty. You can believe anything you want. You have freedom of conscience. You need to be fully persuaded in your own mind. You don't have to agree with me, but you don't have to agree with anyone else either. What you're obligated to do, and notice I use the word obligated, You're obligated to prove all things. You're obligated to search the Scriptures, not obligated by me, but you're obligated before God. And and, and by the way, let's, let's be clear on this. You will give account to God. Don't pretend you won't. I mean, that's just, that's not wise. You are going to give account to God. Let's not pretend otherwise. When God tells us to study to show ourselves approved, It doesn't say, listen to YouTube to be approved. It says to study. And that means you actually have to search the Scriptures for yourselves. So what I hope you do with what I just taught is I hope you take the references and you sit down and you look at them. And I hope you run your own searches. And I hope you do your own homework because you can't trust me. I mean, I could be lying to you. I could be dumb. I could be confused. I mean, you can't rely upon the word of a man. You have to search it for yourself. And that applies not only to my teaching, that applies to everyone's teaching. So my encouragement to you is to search these things, see what the scriptures say, and believe them.